Everything good? Yeah. All right. See. So we're getting better at this. Okay, so I guess we should probably start. Um, for my last class, I did. I'm not sure if you guys have to do this. So. You probably do, but maybe you do. I don't know. But um, last class, I had to sort of arrange midterm week. So I have to bring in like half the class at a time. Then you get two tests. And so it just, you know, the scheduling and everything has to be sort of done appropriately. So <laughs> I'm glad we don't have any tests in here. So. All right, um, so today what we're going to do is uh, we're going to talk about finite dimensional algebras and we're going to talk about the theory of idempotence. And uh, this goes back um, to many, many years. Um, the first place I sort of learned about this is in a book by Curtis and Ryan. So let me just write this. So um, A here is a finite dimensional um, algebra. Uh, and let's say it's over field K. Okay, so it's a ring which is a vector space over K. And uh, we're going to talk about idempotence. <coughs> in A. And uh, so this, this theory can be sort of found in um, a book by Curtis and Ryder, written back in, I think, 1962. Did you, did you ever meet Charlie Curtis when you were at Oregon? Oh, well, no, I think so. Yeah, so he's kind of legendary there. I think he must be close to. Oh, he's got from over 90. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, so Curtis was a was a member of the University of Oregon faculty for a very, very long time. And Ryder was a, at Illinois. And they wrote this uh, beautiful book. Um, it was on associative algebra. It was like 1960. So if you're interested in seeing like all the details of this, I would you know, refer you to, to this book. But uh, you know, there's a lot of theory that goes on, a lot of proofs, but uh, we're not going to be able to go over all the proofs. We just need to you know, highlight some of the important properties. All right, so what's an item potent? So an item potent is an element inside of A um, such that what E squared is E. So, for example, the identity is an item point, trivial item point. So, uh, there's uh, something called the, I can never get this right, whether there's I before E or E before I. So, let me see what I have here. I have small, pure small. So, a lot of times uh, we call this a pure decomposition. So, let's say E. An A, E is an item potent. And uh, what we can do is we can sort of split A up. So we have that one over one minus E is an item potent. Um, and it's orthogonal in the sense that when I take the product of the two item potents, I get zero. Okay. So E times one minus E equals zero. Because that's pretty obvious. So E and one minus E are orthogonal. And whenever you have orthogonal item codes like this, whose sum is actually equal to one, then I can split A up. So A is A times E 
and I can make the direct sum of the composition at one minus. Okay. Now, when you look at this decomposition, um, what do we know? Well, we know that A is a free model. Right? These two are A summands of a free model. So therefore, E A and A times, so A times E and A times one minus E are projective logics. Now, idempotents allow you to split the algebra into projective logics. Now, what I can do is I can go further, and uh, this takes some proof, but uh, you can do the following. So if you take <clears throat> sort of a more general version of this, what you can do is you can sort of take one and split it into primitive item forms, which are orthogonal, E1, E2, up to EF. So you kind of repeat this process, and the PIs are primitive, Okay. So what does primitive mean? It means that EI is not equal to, let's say, F1 direct sum plus F2, where, uh, where these, none of these idempotents are equal to EI. Okay. So this, this cannot happen. So you can't split the idempotents up any further. And uh, what I want to impose is that Again, that these item potents are orthogonal. And then once I do that, I can split the algebra up in terms of projective and decomposable models. And A times EI are what are called projective. You can't split them up anymore. And so the projected indie composable So the projective indie composable modules can be obtained by just taking this sort of item potent decomposition and uh, and sort of looking at the factors. Okay. So why do we know that primitive item potents exist? Um, what you can do is you can just iterate this process kind of over and over again. Now, you know, you may know about this theorem, like if you take a semi-simple like algebra, then it's a um, isomorphic to a direct sum of matrix rings. Right? So this algebra here may not be semi-simple, but when you take the algebra module and it's radical, it turns out to be semi-simple. And uh, and so this will be related to this item potent decomposition too. It's compatible with item potent decomposition. All right. Okay. So next. So this is in terms of looking at item potents um, in general, but now I'm going to look at special types of item potents, which are called central item potents. So now I'm going to do the same thing, except what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at EIs, which are I'm going to call central, so they're in the center of the algebra, uh, primitive item. Okay, and then I want them to be orthogonal again. So CI times CJ is zero and I is not J. Now I can do the same thing. I can split A up in terms of this decomposition, but when you, um, when you look at A times CI, it's not just a left ideal. It's a two-sided ideal too. Okay. So, Put up A in terms of AC1, direct sum ACM, and A times CJ. This is a two 
So the idea is that when you split something up in terms of central primitive eigenfocus, you get a decomposition of A in terms of indecomposable two-sided ideas. So this is a decomposition of A into indecomposable two-sided ideas. And these are precisely called the blocks. Okay. This decomposition is unique. There's sort of a quotient there. So the um, so the A times CJ, let me call this strip EJ, are called. Blocks of it. Okay, so people who have seen this before, if you talk to any like uh, finite group theorist, you know, like who works in modular finite group theory, um, probably has talked about blocks before in their talk. And this is precisely what they're talking about. Now, as I mentioned before, the blocks sort of make the algebra a little bit easier to study. So let me kind of um, say something about this. Okay. And maybe I should say this, say this one. So here's a fact. So let M be and decomposable A mod. All right, so there's a Kroll Schmidt there, namely, like if you take a module, then it can always be broken up in terms of any decomposable modules. So I don't know, maybe I should state that too. Okay, so well, let me just state this first. So let's say I have an indecomposable A model. Um, then it turns out that if you take any of the central item problems on, and you apply it to M, then only one of them is going to be non zero. So then PJ of M is not equal to zero or only one. All right, so since uh, and the rest of them are equal to zero. And so the nice thing is now I can actually stick or say that this module belongs to the block PG. So you say that the module um, belongs. Block okay, so for any indecomposable module, it's only going to belong to one block. And so if I take any indecomposable, so let sorry, let, uh, let's say let N be a, an A module. Let's say it's finite dimensionally. And it turns out that N is a uh, direct sum of even indecomposable modules. So N is going to be N1 direct sum N2 NP, where the NJs are indecomposable. And then what you can do is you can sort of put, um, you know, you can actually look at each of the components and then look at the blocks that it may belong to. Okay, so the way you can kind of think about the blocks are, they're sort of like little receptacles for your algebra. 
Um, so for any decomposable module, you just look at what block it belongs to and you sort of throw it in that receptacle. And uh, why is this useful? So this is useful. Because of the following fact is that X ten of A uh, was a MN is not equal to zero. And then any decomposable modules. So if the extensions, if there's any cohomology between the two modules, then they have to be in the same block. And they can't be in two different blocks and have cohomology in between. So let's say for some. Okay, so this is kind of a crash course in uh, finite dimensional algebra theory and I have one. So are there any questions on this? Maybe you've seen parts of this or some of this before. Is it is it a way to because I know item buttons show up as projections, right? Yes. So is there a way to sort of visualize these as projections in some yeah. kind of yeah, exactly because the P square is e. That, that's that's a projection. Right. See if you like hit a module at times e, right? And then you hit it again times e, then you stay where you are. So so we should think of like the image of of the of of everything of the form e times something is like a projection onto something. Yes, that's right. Exactly. And that's what a projection is, or a projection operator is, right? You can take e, p squared uh, is equal to p. It's a pro projection operator. Very good. All right. Now, um, there's a different side of the story. So I want to actually talk about that. So I talked about item points. Now I need to talk a little bit about uh, representations and how they relate to the item. Okay. So let me erase this part. So I did it a little bit over here with the blocks, but what I want to do is I want to be more specific in terms of the simple modules and the projected modules. Okay. And then I'm going to do an example. So a definition, you've seen this before. So P is projective as name uh, if and only if uh, P is a direct sum of a free module. Okay. Now, um, if I take my algebra A, so A has finitely many simple modules, because it's a finite dimensional um, algebra. And uh, let's label them by L1, L2, up to LT. Okay, so another way to say is these are irreducible representations uh, for the algebra A. Now, for every um, simple module, um, there's a projective module which sits on top. So, so the LI sits on top. So for any LJ does this projective indecomposable model. So this is the connection with the item bodies. Call it PJ um, such that. <coughs> 
Pj surge exon Lj. And if I take Pj modulo its radical, then I get Lj. So I can just take the radical of the algebra times the modulum, that's the radical of Pj. Or I can think of it just like I've done it before. I can look at the smallest uh, submodule such that the quotient is semi simple. Okay. And then moreover, um, there exists an idempotent EJ, uh, where EJ is a primitive idempotent. Um, such that I can realize this pj as a times ej. I can actually realize this projective cover as a sum and of it. Okay, so this is kind of a nice story. You can actually um, get your hands on the projective indecomposable models in some sense. Although it's a big question in representation theory, like what the structure of the projectors are in general. Okay, and a lot of times, um, so these PJs in the literature are called, so I just want to kind of be uh, projective covers. In your representation theory course, did you do like Carton Brouwer triangle at all? Did you talk about that? I don't think so. Okay. All right. Okay. So, yeah, it, it's, if you do finite group representations, you'll, there's a whole, there's a beautiful theory involving these projected colors. Looking at characteristic zero lifts of uh, various uh, finite group representations. Okay, so these are called the projective covers. Um, and another term uh, you might see for the projective indecomposable modules. And uh, sometimes uh, people in the liter literature, uh, especially people in Britain, call them the pins. All right. Okay, now for every simple module, there's a projective cover. And there's a, a beautiful formula which generalizes the Wedenburn decomposition. So this is a, we call it a nice formula. And it basically says, if I take the dimension of A, um, I can take the sum of the dimensions of the projective covers and the simple modules, sort of take the inner product and then of course sum them all. So the sum of uh, J equals one to T, the dimension of the projective cover, the LJ times the dimension of L. Okay. So there's a really nice sort of formula which relates the dimension of the projective indecomposable modules, the dimensions of the simple modules, and the dimension of the algebra itself. And if you notice, if an A is a semi simple algebra, the projective cover is actually equal to the simple module. Okay. So we have A is a semi-simple algebra. And everything is completely reducible. And that means that the projectives are equal to the irreducibles. And when you write this out, 
So the notion of A is equal to the sum. Now, you, you've probably seen this in finite group representations over characteristic zero, right? So then you get dimension of NJ. So this is, uh, this is like the Wedderburn decomposition, right? Because you have a direct sum of matrix algebras, and those each have the square of the dimensions of the irreducible representation. Okay, so this is a generalization of uh, sort of the Wedderburn decomposition that you may have seen before. Okay, questions on this? I'm wondering for the old days, is this the first step of a projective revolution? Uh, yes, it is. Is it like if something go wrong to try and extend? So, so you're exactly right. You just take you take the old day, all right? And then you can cover it with this projection. Yeah. And then you look at the radical and you cover that, right? The radical and you want to put another projective module here. So it turns out once you cover this, you'll find the projective cover for this module. So there's sort of a whole theory of projective cover. So when you just have to know what the, um, what the radical of this module is, and you cover that with all the projectives. And then you use the projectivity problem to lift it to this map over here. And then you just continue the process. And that's how you construct the projective resolution. Yeah. So can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. So I know that there's some, some, some theorem that says that projective modules are equivalent to vector bundles in terms of, uh, in terms of yes. like over schemes. In terms of? O over schemes, so like, a projective model is equivalent to a vector model. Yeah. So do you know, is there a way to visualize that here in this context? Um, probably. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd have to look at it a little bit more. I, don't, I can't think of it right off the top. So. And I'm sure there is, though. Absolutely. Okay. Now, what I'd like to do is um, show you that it's not, it's not so easy finding um, item posts. So I want to do like the easiest possible example of trying to find item posts. And what I want to do is I want to point out the differences um, between varying the characteristic of the field. Well, maybe you've done this in group representations, but let me, let me do it anyway. You can think of this as like Mashka's theorem for, for, uh, for this very special algebra. Okay, so let's do an example. So I'm going to try to look at the, the most basic example possible. And uh, this is the group algebra um, over the group Z mod 2. So it's only a two-dimensional vector space. Um, so this consists basically of formal sums. Um, uh, let me just write it this one. So we take A1 times 1 and A2 times G. So Z2 has just two elements. So I take the identity element of the generator G where G squared is one. Okay. Is everybody okay with that? All right. Now, let's say I have an item post. So let's say E is an item post A1 times 1 plus A2 times G. Now, let's say I take uh, an item so I have to take e squared, which is a1 times 1 plus a2 times g times a1 times 1 plus a2 times g. Okay. 
And uh, you know, you work it out. And if I haven't made any mistakes, I get a1 squared, a2 squared times one plus two a1 a2 times two. Okay, let me use the flow. All right, so uh, I'm assuming that it's an item puzzle. So e squared is e. So um, that means that this has to be equal to um, a times one uh, plus um, a two times two. All right, now. Um, if a if a two is zero, so let's say, let's analyze these equations. So we're just gonna down and do this. So I have to have that a one is equal to a one squared plus a two squared. Okay, and I have to have that two a one a two is equal to a two. All right, so first of all, if a2 is zero, so if a2 is zero, then, well, it's clear what happens. Um, e is equal to a1 times one, right? And we have that uh, a1 is either gonna be equal to um, zero or one, all right? Yeah, so A1 is going to be 0, 1. So that E will either be 0, 1. Okay, so not much is happening here. Okay, you just get the obvious item functions. Okay. So I'll call these the trivial item functions. All right, so we, we sort of know there are trivial item functions around. They're not very exciting. Now, if a2 is not zero, then we need to model. So if a2 is not equal to zero, then this equation here gives you that 2a1 is actually equal to um, one. Okay. All right, so now what do you have to worry about? Include something about a one. It's equal to half. Yeah. Well, I mean, so so let me ask you this. I mean, when can I conclude a one is equal to one half? Characteristic of k is not two. That's right. So if the characteristic of k is not two. So this is an important thing. Then I have a one equal to half. Okay. Good. Now, um, so if a one's equal to half, then I can actually uh, put things back um, in up here. So uh, what do I get? I get one half. So one half is equal to one fourth plus a two squared. Right. Okay. So uh, one half is equal to a two squared. Uh, one fourth. So, okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, now I have two solutions. So a2 is equal to one half or a2 is equal to minus one half. So I get two item functions, and those are going to be primitive item functions. So then I get that e1 is equal to uh, one half one plus g, and um, e2 is equal to one half. One minus two. 
and I split things up very nicely with my algebra as long as the characteristic is not two. So if the characteristic of K is not two, I doesn't divide the order of the group, then my algebra is split up into A times E1 where it's some A times E2. Okay? And uh, these are both one dimensional. Right, so uh, these should be matrix rings. Uh, and can anyone tell me what <coughs> reducibles they correspond to? What irreducible representations do you know for Z2? Building a sign? Yeah, trivial on the sign, right? Z2 is the same as sigma 2, right? So I have a trivial sign. Can you see right kind of which one is a trivial? Anyway, when is a trivial sign? I'll just say you guys can figure it out. Okay. And the algebra splits up as a trivial plus the sign representation. Now, what happens if the characteristic is equal to two? If characteristic of k equals two. Okay, so let me just back up over here. All right, let's back up to these equations, right? So this is zero. So that means that a2 has to be zero. But we already we already analyzed the case when a2 is zero. Then the eigenpotent is either zero or one. So what that means is that the algebra itself um, is indecomposable. So this implies that a here is an indecomposable. In fact, it's a projected indecomposable A module. It is projected. Okay. Well, it's a projected indecomposable A module uh, of dimension what? Well, it's a dimension of A. Space. Well, what's the dimension? Two, right? Now, it turns out that, um, and this isn't taking much work, but it turns out there's only one irreducible representation when the field is characteristic two, just the trivial representation. So the only irreducible representation here is just the trivial representation. Okay, so when the characteristic A equals two, then uh, I'll call it L equals K is the only irreducible rep or only simple model. Okay. Well, that doesn't leave very much. So if I have, if I have this module over here, and the um, only irreducible representation is the trivial module, we have a two-dimensional representation. Then what does its composition series have to look like? Anyone? 
Oh, two dimensional, right? How many composition factors? One. One? How many? The trivial one is only one dimension, right? It's three, the whole thing, quotient, and the trivial. Well, I mean, okay, so I take A. Right? And I know I have to, the only composition factor is the trivial one. Right? So I have the trivial module sitting inside of it. Yeah. When I take the quotient, how big is it? Right. So I only have two composition factors, right? So A has A sitting down at the bottom. So this is in the sock. Okay. So that's the, that's in the cycle, and then this is in the next layer up in the cycle. Uh, similarly, this is actually in the in the head, and it's a over the radical. This is this is the decomposition, and this is not clearly not um, semi simple. All right, so um, this is a very simple example in many ways, but what it does is it gives you the flavor of modular representation theory. Because unlike the case when we have characteristic zero, where you have the complete reducibility, you know, like with Moshka's theorem, in the case when you have a characteristic where the characteristic divides in the group, you may not have a semi simple situation. Modules are not necessarily completely reducible anymore. And here's a here's a classic example. So let me just say this is a, this is modular representation. If you take anything away from today, you can just sort of think about modular representation theory as like even just taking projective and decomposable modules. And finding out what the structure of projective and decomposable modules are. So we don't know the answer like to many, many situations. Uh, if you take the general linear group, for example, then if you take a prime which divides the order of the finite general linear group, you don't know the answer to that question. Clearly vital. Okay, any questions on this? So maybe I should mention one more thing about this. So uh, one thing I hope is that you know some of these principles you'll actually see in talks on representations. So let me talk about one more concept, and um, these are called Carton invariants. So it's not hard to uh, sort of state this. So right now I, I gave you an example of a projective module. This is the projective cover for K. Okay? And so you can sort of ask yourself the following. So if you take an irreducible representation for a finite dimensional algebra and you look at its projective cover. So let's say that the L1 of the L2 are the simple A modules. So you just break down all the possible simple A modules up to which are non isomorphic. And then you take T1 up to TT. You take the objective covers. And so what you like to do is you like to know what the composition factors are inside of each of these projective covers. And that's what the Carton matrix is. So when I write PI LJ the number of times LJ 
appears as a composition factor of PI. Okay, so that makes sense, right? This is the PI is just a module for this composition series. And I'll just get the Carton matrix. Carton matrix is um, PI LJ. Okay, so the IJ entry is just the number of times LJ appears in something. And this is what's called the Carton matrix. Different Carton matrix than the major. Okay, this is a Carton matrix. In the, in the theory of finite dimensional algebras. So it's not like with root systems or anything like that. This is completely different. It's still called the Carton matrix. All right, so over here, um, right? so, so the Carton matrix uh, just involves. Um, one entry, you know, and uh, it's the number of times the trivial module appears in here. Yeah. Well, uh, one entry is two. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, any questions on this? Okay, good. So uh, we have a little bit of time to start the new topic. All right, so well, maybe people, people might know more about this than I do, so I'm happy if you find that. So what I, I want to talk about next are I'm going to call it group schemes. Um, so I don't know what the best way to motivate this is, but a lot of times, you know, what you want to do is um, you want to sort of talk about finite dimensional hop algebras. So here's one thing is that. When I, I have, I'll mention this later on. So if you talk about group schemes, um, this turns out to be equivalent to finite dimensional co commutative hop algorithms. Now, true for affine group schemes? Or? Yeah, yeah, I didn't actually mention affine group schemes. So. I was going to say this too. Well, let me just put it out on here. Okay, good. So um, now, the reason we like to talk about group schemes is they behave um, sort of similarly to the groups. Do is I could talk about sort of normal. Subgroup schemes, and I can take quotients and I do things in the appropriate way. And so the language is, is just, it's, a, it's cumbersome working with algebras. It's much easier sort of working with groups in some sense. So this is actually a more, um, so obviously this, is, this here is a, a more, I don't know if the word likable, more likable language. Everyone likes groups. Now, the disadvantage is it's more abstract. And, uh, and you know, this is, I'm not exactly sure about the history about this, but I think it goes back to um, the work of Grothendieck, for example. And, uh, and 
the thing is it's more abstract but in the same way it's, it's easier to work with in some sense so what we'll do is we'll sort of we'll translate back and forth once in a while but sometimes it's actually better to work with you know, this side rather than this so let me give you an example Now I haven't defined anything yet, but this is just an example. So let's say G is a reductive algebraic group. And I can look for the word scheme here. Okay, so you can actually think of uh, like GLN, SLN as a group scheme. Now you have a nice map, which is called the Pervanius map, which goes from G to G. Okay, now there's a way to define it for any reflective group, but let me just do it for the general linear group. So if I take uh, GLN, GLN, now the reason why I'm not putting like GLN C or GLN K, for example, inside of here is because you sort of insert the coefficients. You let the coefficients run over all commuted to K algebras. And the Fabius takes a matrix here and it just raises each entry to the big top. Okay, so this turns out to be a map of group schemes and uh, Is that a steep fix something? Yeah. So whenever you have Frobenius, um, the, the field that you're working with um, has characteristics to be very uh, You know, you need it to be actually a, a map of groups. Yeah. Okay. So when you do that, you can take the kernel which I'm going to call G1. And this is also an affine group scheme. Okay, so it's not a group, it's not an algebraic group per se, uh, the group scheme, but we could still we still have a coordinate algebra. So we still have sort of functions which sort of define this group scheme. So this is a coordinate algebra. This is a good example to keep in mind. Okay, this is a finite dimensional algebra too. So this turns out to be finite dimensional. And then um, what I can do is I can take its dual. So when I take its dual, and let's call this A, this is a finite dimensional co-commutative off algebra. And the theorem says that representations for G1 are equivalent to representations for representations for G1 are equivalent to representations for G1. And uh, now you know why, now you can see why I wanted to talk about finite dimensional algebras, because sometimes you want to look at this in terms of group schemes. Sometimes you want to look at this in terms of finite dimensional algebras. So we want to kind of pass back and forth between the, the two languages. Okay. All right, so that gives you a brief introduction. So let me just kind of um, give you a flavor for 
what I mean by group factor. So let's see. Okay. When I was first learning this, it was kind of a, kind of hard to get my head wrapped around this idea. Here's kind of the way I thought about this. All right, so so R is going to be a, a commutative scale. And uh, I'm going to assume that um, I'm always going to assume that this thing has an identity in some case. All right. So the idea is when you take um, the general linear group GLN, um, you sort of know what that means. Right? You just take matrices which have some sort of like the determinant is non zero condition. Right? So you usually plug in a field to, to G1. But what I want to do is I want to think about plugging in any commutative K algebra into this. Okay. When I plug in any commutative K algebra, I spit out a group. So this actually gives you a functor from commutative K algebras to groups. Okay, so I can do GLN. I get the SLN, right? So you just plug in any R into here, I get a group. So, so I want to consider the prompter, it's called K, it's R for F, and it's going to go from commuting to K algebras and let me enter. It's sort of just by plugging in coefficients, and that's the easiest way to see that. So in this case, you take F of R, and then you get like GL and R. Okay. And uh, this is actually a functor. So I want to make it consider this as a functor. And uh, so, therefore, you know, if I have a map between commutative K algebras, I would get better than a map between groups. So, given a map of commutative K algebras, and you get a map, a covariant map, which goes yes. Now, um, there's a way to sort of see um, the connection between affine group schemes. These are what I call affine group schemes, and also off algebras. Okay. Uh, the targeting of this function, something like you have uh, just more structured ring structure or something. Uh, uh, for K algebras. You might, but uh, right now you're just going for arbitrary K algebras. So you kind of have to set it up right to get this equivalence in some sense. So. All right. All right, let's see. Okay. Do, are people familiar with representable functors at all? Yes or no? Kind of. All right. Uh, all right. So maybe maybe I'll let's see. When are we supposed to stop? Eight minutes. Okay. I think I, I'm supposed to stop, right? Yeah. Okay. So we'll stop now. But next time, what I'll do is I'll start in on some things that are representable functors, and then I'll make the connection with all now. I don't want to, you know, spend like you get to the entire semester. I don't want to kind of give you a little bit. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.